Welcome back to our community. Susie Thomas visiting with State Senator Scott Olslager, talking about uh, medical marijuana and, um, again, operative word, medical. Right. So um, what what happens? I mean, how concerned are we that it then turns into recreational, although it's not the same substance, as I understand? Well, again, we, we, the guardrails we put in there, it, the recreational marijuana will, will remain illegal. Mm-hmm. And again, this you, this will not be something you could smoke even for medical marijuana. And it'll be ingestibles, um, creams, things like that, that people can utilize if they have a specific medical condition. The bill calls for 21 different medical conditions that you can qualify. And your doctor would have to write a recommendation. They can't write a prescription because of federal law, but they can write a recommendation. And the doctors will know, and doctors have been licensed, of course, in this area, and they will know what qualifies and what doesn't. For example, AIDS and HIV positive people mm-hmm. could possibly qualify. Mm-hmm. Alzheimer's disease is out there. Um, multiple sclerosis, cancer victims, people are struggling from cancer, epilepsy, uh, glaucoma, fibromyalgia, things like that mm. that are very serious, that traumatic brain injury. So there's a list of 21 very specific symptoms that you'd have to qualify for. To, and this, this is the only way you could get it. The State Board of Pharmacy is estimating uh, that uh, there'd be two to 300,000 Ohioans that could would qualify. And as you know, we have approximately around, around 11 million Ohioans mm-hmm. in the state. This was so very, that so that large of a percentage of yeah, two Ohio. to three hundred thousand, but there's eleven million people. Okay, well that's not yeah, that many yeah, then. So sounds uh, like a big number until yeah. you put it that way. There's some conflicting numbers, but that's what the mm-hmm. board of pharmacy, state board of pharmacy, is saying. That was the, the the witnesses and the people that came into my office were is pretty tr- dramatic. Uh, parents who came who testified and to, to the legislature about their children having multiple multiple seizures every day, and they took them out of state and it, it seemed to help seizures. People with severe pain from cancer treatments, um, so so there is a good use for it if it's used correctly and if, properly. If it's used correctly, who grows it? Who's allowed to grow it? The uh, the state of Ohio the Department of Commerce is issuing licenses to indiv- to groups or individuals, companies, whatever that will will grow it. It'll be strictly regulated. Uh, I know that some of the what I've, I've heard so far, a lot of it will be inside, grown inside with, mm-hmm. with high security on the outside mm-hmm. to make sure nobody can break in and, and steal it. So it'll be highly regulated at every stage, from the growing stage to the cultivation stage to the dispensing stage. So it's not in the growing that it's different. It's in the processing, turning it into whatever kind of a pharmaceutical comes from medical marijuana. That makes it be not the thing that uh, that would make a person high. I, I'm I, I'm just keep going back to thinking. My goodness, we have enough danger out there on the roads with drunk drivers and so mm-hmm. forth. Do we really want people also smoking marijuana and driving as well? But you're saying that is not. That's the confusion there. That's yeah. not happening. That's not, that's my understanding. That's correct. Got it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, talking about driving and danger of driving, you've been working on texting and driving at the same time. What, yes. what can you tell us about yes. that? Yes, the governor did sign a bill recently that deals with uh, the drivers could face an extra one hundred dollar fine if they're talking or texting when they violate certain traffic laws. Certain things would be like uh, trips to big traffic lights, speeding, left to center, going the wrong, wrong way on a, on a ramp. Uh, failing to turn, use turn signal, things like that. But they could waive it if they attended a, a distracted driving class. Mm. So. Mm. S- don't text and drive. Yes. It, it's so dangerous. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. But at least we're, we're addressing it mm-hmm. with actual legislation. Um, Scott, more in general, how are you saving taxpayers' money these days? Well, the, the main thing that we're doing is we're just keeping a good close eye in the budget mm-hmm. and to make sure that... Uh, the money is being spent wisely. Uh, and so far, as I told you earlier, that things have been going pretty well that way. Yeah, yeah. You've been doing sp- some specific things for some of the those more low-income voters. What are those things? With the low-income folks right now, the, we've, the governor signed a bill that deals with suspended driver's licenses. A person has to be show that they're indigent 
and uh, they have uh, and, and have their driver's license suspended for a certain amount of time. And this will allow the judge to reduce the uh, the, the, in the BMV to reduce the reinstatement fee. Okay. To a little bit, but they have that to show they're indigent, and because that's losing their driver's license is one way that one of the main ways for people to remain in poverty. Mm. So. Mm, interesting. Uh, something that pops up into my head is those payday lending places that there seem to be on every corner. Yeah. Um, what are those, first of all? And what do they do? It seems to me that there would be more likelihood that they would be driving a person into owing more and more and more than to ever getting out of the debt that they've got. Well, you've kind of sum- summarized it all right there. Oh. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, well, I'm sure you say it better. This is what happens when uh, people, some people cannot, for whatever reasons, do not have a, a bank account. So they need to go someplace to get loans. And what was happening is Ohio was recognized as one of the most expensive uh, in the country for these people to borrow money. And so a group came to us and said, you know, we've got to crack down on this because many times people are stuck in this cycle for a long time. And they just can't get out because the loan, the rates are so high. Some of the, the uh, rates are, that was discussed in front of my committee were over 500% APR interest. What? And so it was very high. So what we did in this bill, and it was a bill that I will say passed in a bipartisan vote in the Senate, 21 to 9, 14 Republicans, and I carried the bill in the Senate, 14 Republicans and, and seven Democrats passed the bill, nine Republicans opposed it. And some of the things we did there was limit the interest rate to 28%. We said that the loans can only be for one year at a time. Mm-hmm. Max, maximum loan at any given time, as far as per loan, is one thousand dollars. But we capped per year at twenty five hundred. Well, I was going to say, how many can you, yeah? Just twenty five hundred. Mm-hmm. It also for the for loans of under ninety days, it, the monthly payment cannot be more than six to seven percent, either net or gross of a person's income, because that's how they can get trapped when they have to. The loan repayment is too high for them to be able to handle. So we did all, all those type of things. We also shut down, the, in the process of shutting down, uh, the, the type of places where people go and put their cars up for collateral. Mm, and they would lose their cars. Because then they end up not having a car. What would happen to a person? Well, I cannot imagine if you don't have enough money to pay a certain bill, how you could possibly afford to pay five times that bill then mm-hmm. later if the interest is 500%. Yeah. What would happen to these people? This is predatory, is it not? Well, we felt that it was not appropriate. Mm-hmm. And so we decided we needed to regulate this. Uh, we think we've put in a very pro-consumer bill, legislation to protect people, and still allow the companies, some companies, to do business in the state of Ohio to, to, to offer What's this the response? Do people say, hey, wait, I need to be able to borrow more than this. You're not letting me borrow well, enough. We'll see what happens once the bill actually goes into place. Okay. But from based on the Colorado experience, uh, and Colorado did do some cracking down on this, and this bill is not the Colorado bill, but some it's kind of modeled after Colorado. There were still a number of companies doing business, so people could get get loans. Is this one of those things where you were able to, again, work Republicans and Democrats together with just really the consumer in mind? Yes, that's not exactly what had to happen, because if it didn't, we couldn't have got it done. Same way in the House, the bill, the final version in the House passed by over 60 votes, and there was a bipartisan vote in the House to get that done also. How is it possible to do that? At this level, and for some reason, as we watch what's going on in, uh, down in Washington, to see such, I don't think I've ever seen such polarization in my life. Mm-hmm. What happens between going from your hometown down to the nation's capital? What happens there? Well, I think part of it is Columbus, we're a lot smaller pond than Washington is. You know, they have a, they have a budget of a couple trillion dollars a year. We spend sixty-six billion over two years for state tax dollars, but then all tax dollars, federal and state, about hundred thirty billion. So it's a smaller pond. There's thirty-three senators and ninety-nine House members, so we get to know each other pretty well. Uh, the and you get to them know them personally really well. Mm-hmm. So that there, you don't have these walls coming up so severely. We, I tell people, if they come down to the Senate chamber and watch us vote. You would be shocked that probably 85 percent of the votes are bipartisan. They're like thirty-two yeah. to nothing, thirty-three to nothing, thirty-two wow. to one, whatever the case may be. I've act, I've actually had people do that and say, 
I'm surprised to see that. I thought there'd be a lot of bickering and back and forth, and there isn't. Now, when it comes down to spending and taxing issues, that's where you do have the partisan votes Mm -hmm. because there is a difference between the two parties and Mm -hmm. spending and taxing. But even even after that, you know, you can have a very uh, a very strong debate with a member on the other side. But when you're done, all of us sometimes have come up to the other member on the other side and say, well, yeah, you did a good job with your speech. We obviously didn't agree. And, and of course, uh, uh, the bill passed the way that my side wanted to pass because we control the chamber. But but I said, you know, we just appreciate that. And I do appreciate that you have differing views. That's what our, makes our country great. Yeah. And just because somebody has a differing view, you can still be their friend. And so you'll, you'll see that in Columbus a lot. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, if two people are thinking exactly alike all the time, then one of them is not necessary, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's good to have different points of view. But civility, while you're expressing it, Mm -hmm. uh, is maybe a lost art in some circles. Um, For the voters, news about voting machines, I think you have? Yes, we the voting machines, a lot of the voting machines we now have in Ohio that we vote on, were a result of the <clears throat> the problem that we had back in the 2000 election. And so a lot of them now <laughs> have become hanging older. Hanging chads? <coughs> Excuse me. The, uh, and so <laughs> the, that, yeah, we got rid of the hanging, oh, the the, the hanging, hanging chads, chads machines, and we went to the ones we have. But they're getting older. That means they're you know, 13, 14, 15 years old. And so the county commissioners and, and the board of elections from across the state came to us and said, we need some help to help buy these machines. So we put together a mechanism that uh, we'll be spending $114 million approximately that the local com- counties can, can go to and work out some kind of deal to buy new voting machines to bring them up to date. And what will these look like? How will these operate? You know, I don't I, I don't know exactly what they're going to look like. and how, I'm, not, I'm not a technical person that mm-hmm. way. I saw them, you know, they're going to be similar to those little boxes we vote. Still a screen now. that you tap the screen. Could be a screen. Could Sometimes there could be a scanner. Okay. A scanning type machine. And I guess there's a hybrid of the both of them somehow that with a printout so you know you could actually see, see you in a paper printout how you did vote. And so we're excited about that because we, we want integrity in our elections. Nothing's worse than going into the polling place and the machine's not working. I've heard stories, you know, that that has happened and, mm-hmm. and then people have to, they have to stop that, pull that machine and, and it can be a problem. So this was long overdue and it'll be sort of a bonding mechanism we're utilizing at the state level to help the locals uh, in cooperation with the state to buy those. What kind of timeline again did you say? I believe that the goal is to try to have them in place next year in the off-year election. So any kinks can be worked out before uh, we go into the uh, presidential election 2020 <laughs> well, that'll and, be, and all that. Well, that won't be emotional or heated <laughs> yeah. at all, will it? Yeah. <laughs> so we want to make sure those machines are in place and they've been, they've been worked through and Very people good. are comfortable with them. Uh, will we ever get to the point where we're voting from our phones, do you think? I hope not. I, I, you know, I, I would be very hesitant about anything yeah. like that. I've heard people say, my goodness, we vote on uh, talent shows and, and so forth um, with those, and they have some kind of a way of being able to count those and cut it off after you've done it, and you're only allowed one. But, yeah, it does seem that that would be a, a little far removed from reality. Um, it's, I, I, I would be very uncomfortable people voting from their phones. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so good seeing uh, your really lifelong commitment to mm-hmm. serving. Um, I know faith's got a huge part of that. You felt called to this for a long time. Just in our closing moments, for you, just this lifetime of service, what has has that meant to you? Well, I believe that uh, you know the the good Lord tells you the greatest commandment: love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And your neighbor, when you love your neighbor as yourself, you want to make their life as best as you can in a, in a time of service. My dad taught social studies, and so he kind of drilled it in my head from the time I was growing up. But you touch a lot of lives in this particular job. You touch a lot of lives through the social work you do through your office where somebody is desperate for trying to get some kind of, any kind of help. Just mm-hmm. to, It can be anything. Mm-hmm. And you're, you do the best you can to help them. When you pass legislation, you're not, this isn't just words or numbers on a piece of paper, it, that, those words and numbers translate into touching people's lives. Mm-hmm. And you, your goal in life is to try to do the best you can to make their life as good as they can for other people. And that's what we've tried to do in all the years I've had the privilege of serving. 
Well, we appreciate you, State Senator Scott Olsleger. Thanks for all you do in our community. Thanks, Susie. Good to see you.